First one, are we going into a period where we start to worry about a delicate balance of terror? Once again, the coin Albert Wallstetter's, or recoin Albert Wallstetter's phrase. Particularly given precision conventional uh, weapons, and also what will be an increasing dependence on cyber, which might challenge command and control uh, cap capabilities. So I think it is that, qu that old question, is it coming back? Secondly, what about some of the problems associated with deterrence in the Cold War? For example, deterrence and reassurance can sometimes be provocative. And probably the best example of that was Abel Archer, where we frightened the Russians to the point where they, they might have been considering the possibility of going to war, uh, and we didn't even know we were in a crisis. Uh, so I think that was an important one. And the third one, do we still have a capacity for crisis management? Uh, partly during the Cold War, we learned from earlier crises and we developed a set of codes of conduct uh, that were helpful. Uh, we haven't got that kind of background anymore and it's not clear we have the institutional memory uh, in government for that. So how do we recreate it if we have lost it? Thanks for the questions, Phil. Um, all very interesting. Um, I think the answer to the first question is very possibly yes, um, for all the reasons you cite. Uh, so I think cyber is one of the factors that will uh, perhaps test our ability to maintain stability, what we used to call strategic stability. is a big debate in the United States and probably in other places too about wither strategic stability. And it's not just a function of the deterioration of, of relations with the Russians, it's a function of these new technologies that are emerging on the scene. Certainly cyber is one of them. Um, hypersonic uh, missile systems are another. Um, you know, the potential growth in missile defense and the potential threat it poses to strategic stability in combination with, with, with hypersonics. All these things, when you weigh against the fact that we're really not talking to the Russians very much about these right now, we don't have a working arms control process, et cetera, et cetera. All those things, I think, do begin to raise questions whether, um, wh whether we have to return in a much harder way and very soon to questions of, of strategic stability. I talked about deterrence in a regional context. I think that's very important. Uh, but we may be coming to a point, as you suggest, where we have to return to the basic sort of bilateral relationship and understand where that's headed and where the dangers are. And at some point, China comes into that conversation as well, given, given the heavy investment they're making in certain kinds of capabilities, too. Um, can assurance be provocative? Um, yeah, potentially. I think that's one of the factors we have to take into account. And I think one of the issues that and I'll, I'll defer to, to, to my friends in, who spent more time in NATO on this question, but in, in the debate in NATO after Ukraine about what to do to enhance deterrence, to enhance assurance, I'm sure there were debates about well, how far do we go? I mean, where, where is the line where our efforts to be reassuring and our efforts to enhance deterrence and Russian perceptions, um, you know, might create a situation that we're in fact trying to avoid, okay? Um, so I think that's a fair question. I tried to allude to that a little bit in my comments about Korea. There are, I think there are concern, have been concerns on the American side about some of these efforts by South Korea to develop these sort of independent uh, strike capabilities and, and whether we would have control over how they would use them in a crisis and whether their use of these capabilities, particular strike capabilities that we do, would be directed against strategic North Korean targets, um, whether that might sort of lead us into a conflict. Um, so I think there are ways in which uh, the things we try to do to assure allies or enhance deterrence in specific contexts, um, we, have, we do have to worry about where the line is, where, 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 we, where you sort of step into actions that begin to, to shape the adversary's perception in the wrong direction as opposed to the right direction. Um, do we still have a capacity for crisis management? I'm not sure. Uh, that's, a, that's a tougher question. I think one of the challenges in NATO is, is just that. I mean, part of, part of the Russian uh, sort of hybrid war, gray zone, political warfare uh, strategy, I think, is to um, make it harder for NATO to, to achieve consensus in a crisis. I think a lot of what they're doing is, is sort of setting conditions for potential future crises where it would be very difficult for NATO to reach consensus decisions on the use of force in response to various forms of Russian aggression. I think NATO as an institution recognizes this. I think if you talk to NATO folks about the adaptation strategy generally, um, you know, post-Ukraine, it's certainly, um, yeah, it's certainly the question of the toolkit, right, conventional nuclear missile defense, but it's also the softer stuff, the software that Yashek was referring to in terms of crisis management and intelligence and, and um, 
and crisis decision making. And I, I think those things are particularly challenging for NATO just because of the way NATO is. And I think if you have a candid conversation with NATO folks, they tell you that's, that's an area where we're kind of weak right now and where we need to get stronger. But the path, the path to doing that is, is not entirely clear. So I hope that addresses some of what you were talking about. I'll, I'll just add to what Paul said about the uh, uh, question two, provocative nature. I think this is one reason we, uh, we in NATO limited the enhanced forward presence in Eastern Europe uh, because of that exact concern, that we wanted to provide assurance to our Baltic and East European member states without unnecessarily provoking Moscow. Uh, so we have combat battalions instead of brigades. I mean, the United States is doing some other bilateral things to en enhance uh, even more. But there were limits, and part of the reason for those limits is that right after, in 2014, there were member states of NATO that, and perhaps still to this day, that don't see Russia as a problem. And it's very difficult to achieve consensus in an organization of 29 member states when some of them either don't believe the problem others are pointing to is a problem or think there are other problems, perhaps from the South, that are more important and rec should require the uh, attention of the alliance. And there are limits. I mean, the alliance uh, in typical NATO fashion came up with a solution. We're going to have a 360-degree approach. You know, we worry about everything. Okay, but where's the money to worry about everything? Are we rebuilding fleets in the North Atlantic? Are we projecting stability in some way to North Africa and increasing our deterrence capabilities against Russia and enhancing our assurance uh, in Eastern Europe? We can't do it all. Well, we could, but we're not willing to do it all. We're not willing to pay for it. So we have a policy that says one thing, and we ha then have to make uh, tough decisions about where we're really going to put our emphasis. And uh, anyway, all of this is behind the scenes on what you see coming out of NATO, and we're going to see more of that in a couple of weeks at this year's summit, where part of the adaptation will be restructuring, restructuring the alliance to some extent to take into account these threats that we've kind of ignored uh, for the last decade or more. Um, okay. Yasek had a point yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to, to go to the, to, the, to the point about uh, the delicate balance of power. I, I think that in the last three decades or, or so after the end of the Cold War, uh, NATO didn't have to worry about it, but it becomes delicate again for all the reasons uh, which uh, were mentioned in the questions, but, but also by Paul. But I think what's also important that uh, I think that sooner or later, we as the West will reach a point which we perhaps would be forced to make some decisions which might be very uncomf uncomfortable for us to somehow preserve this delicate balance in the sense that you know we would have to somehow uh, make investment decisions of you know some things which we think are no longer needed or you know it's Past, past us. So I think that 2018 NPR, which uh, like which which uh, included a, a decision about the supplementary nuclear capabilities, is kind of uh, let's say perhaps uh, uh, like show it to to some extent in the sense that the discussion, at least within NATO, in the past decade was that in terms of nuclear capabilities, we don't need any anything more we are like okay with what we ha w w what we have and like now like us concluded concluded that something more is needed and it's not only about nuclear but also in terms of the of conventional capabilities we see the inf treaty discussions in in europe you know where of course anytime any someone mentions the uh, ground launch cruise missiles in europe everyone is terrified and no one wants to like go back this 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 route, but like I, I I'm not so sure that in like five years from now, uh, depending on what what would happen, you know, like we would not have to uh, have to have to have to do this. So I think that you know, like preserving this delicate balance of of terror uh, or or um, balance of power might be. Mm, 
like extensively less comfortable for, for us, the West. And it somehow goes to the second question about deterrence and, and reassurance, if it can be provocative. Uh, like, of course, of course it can, but I think it also touches the question about understanding our adversaries. So if I were like working for the Russian Ministry of Foreign <coughs> Affairs, I wouldn't miss a chance to call anything what NATO does as provocative. So I think there is a thin line, you know, that we have to somehow keep in mind that it's also part of this operational uh, informational spectrum of like influencing our our uh, decisions and uh, and uh, thinking and like there's a disagreement for example about like what NATO has done so far in terms of conventional adaptations so something that Russia is actually thrilled about what what it has seen like how small NATO did and on the other spectrum people think that we actually did, did too much. So I think this kind of understanding of, of uh, the way the, the, the Russia thing is, is, is I think, uh, very, very important. Yeah. I have a quick addendum to what Jacek just said. Um, in some sense, we are returning to some of the problems of the Cold War, provocative reassurance, balance of terror, because we, at least in the United States, have lost the muscle memory of having lived through it before, I think the Russians are far more aware of what game they're playing, game, what they're doing relative to what they used to do. They know what they're doing. There's a strategy there. Yasek mentioned the INF Treaty and the ground launch cruise missile. I work for Congress. There's a lot of support in Congress for the United States designing and deploying its own new ground launch cruise missile in Europe. Is it, and, and, and the attitude is, why not? And then my head explodes. It's like, it almost broke the alliance the last time. Do you want to break the alliance again? And you just heard the alliance doesn't want, they don't remember. So a lot of what we're seeing with how the West, the United States in particular, is kind of bungling about with this inability to do crisis management and this inability to come up with a coherent response. Within the halls of government, there isn't a lot of muscle memory. And we've gotten so used to not having people see us as, or not caring when people see us as provocative, or not caring about muddling through crises because we will eventually prevail, that we are now in an environment where structure and memory and thinking about these things in a coherent way is going to be far more important. So whether or not the problems are new or re-existing from old problems, what's new is our inability to see them the way that they uh, used to be seen. Uh, well, my question is about the um, recent change of heart in the U.S. Um, policy and uh, they're coming out of the Iran's uh, nu uh, the nuclear deal, uh, deal with Iran. Uh, my question is that do you see it as a a shift to a new era in the deterrence strategy of the U.S. and whether you see it as a negative or a positive um, um, path uh, towards solving the issues in the Middle East and in the world. The sense that there's a strategy behind the withdrawal from the <laughs> Iran agreement, please get over that. Unless the strategy is I didn't like it, I said I didn't like it, I promised I would tear it up and Obama signed it. If it, 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 that's the Trump strategy on the Iran agreement. Mm -hmm. During the debate, particularly during the debate in Congress over the agreement when it was signed, and this is not my issue area, so this is only what I've heard, there were healthy, robust, and logical disagreements about whether an agreement limited to only the nuclear pro problems without capturing all the other problems was the way to go, the right way to go or the wrong way to go. Signing the agreement and getting it through Congress, even in a backwards way, the conclusion was it was the right way to go or better than the alternatives. If the answer is now we believe that limiting our approach to only the nuclear agreement without, while ignoring the rest of the destabilizing activities is the wrong way to go, that's a strategic decision. That could be a policy decision. That could have emphasis for the future. 
but I think you're stepping out way in front of the game to assume that's the reason the decision was made. But there is a logical argument there. It's just not the one that caused the decision. And other than that, I can't speak for the government. Yeah, I think like from the alliance politics perspective, it's of course creates waves in, in terms of like relationship between the US and its European allies in, in particular. So I think that uh, like the most important thing perhaps I don't know to what extent it would happen and would be possible to delink this issue from others. But you know, the other kind of uh, way of looking into the things is that all these things would somehow become linked to each other. I mean, the mm. JCPOA, JC, JCPOA and sanctions, then tariffs, then you know, uh, two percent spending, and you know, they might be somehow be used in, in, in kind of a US approach towards towards allies. Yeah, I'm just, you know, it's it's unclear of how the things uh, are going to work and I'm I'm yeah perhaps more on the optimistic side that the some modus vivendi would be would be fine even at least initia initially it's going to be difficult. Yeah I, I'm not an Iran expert. I do do watch them on television, though. Um, you know, I. I, I <laughs> right. uh, yeah, it's hard to see a lot. All, it's hard to see a lot of strategic design behind this decision. I mean, it's, I don't think it's certainly to answer your question directly. I don't think it represents a shift in U.S. deterrence strategy. Some might argue it may represent a shift in U.S. non-proliferation strategy. On the other hand, while we're walking away from this deal, we're seeking a deal with with another rogue state, and and we're prepared to talk to that state maybe along similar terms, so it's not clear how you reconcile those things at the strategic level. I think it's a shift in Iran strategy more than anything else. It reflects this administration's view about Iran. I mean, there are a lot of Iran hardliners, so to speak, in the administration. Uh, and of course, the president campaigned on, on this deal being rotten, and so he felt compelled, I think, to leave. It raises the question about what what next? What what comes after the JCPOA? And here, it's hard to discern what the strategy is at this point. I'm sure someone's working on it, but um, you know what they're working on isn't quite clear. Um, it does raise some questions, though, about deterrence. If you want to broaden your aperture a little bit, um, one question is: Well, if we're walking away from this agreement, and you know, it, we may pay lip service to the idea that we want a better agreement with Iran. You know, you have to consider the possibility that that's not going to be realistic. I mean, it could happen. But if it doesn't happen, the question is then, are we prepared to deter Iran, to actively deter Iran from reaching, uh, from reaching a nuclear capability? You know, are we actively pre are prepared to actively deter them from stepping into a breakout phase, if you will, once they reach that point? And if we are, what does that deterrent strategy look like? Okay. Or are we going to outsource that to the Israelis? You know, um, the, the, the other question about deterrence, I think, goes to extended deterrence um, and, and whether and how we think about the question of extended deterrence in the Middle East, okay? Because if we're prepared for a future in which, you know, we're, we're going to confront Iran, okay, if we can't contain it, um, then, then how do we protect our allies in the region? You know, is there a discussion to be had with our allies in the region about extending some form of deterrence? Uh, to them. We've had conversations like this in the past. When we signed the JCPOA, President Obama gathered the leaders of the region in, at, at Camp David, and we talked about various kinds of military security cooperation. We even I may have used the term security guarantees. I think Secretary of State Kerry may have used that, those words at one point. Um, how far those guarantees would go? Would they be conventional? Would they be nuclear? Would they be ambiguous? All, all important questions that we really don't know the answers to. We see a country like Saudi Arabia trying clearly, openly trying to position itself to acquire nuclear capability downstream. Uh, is that in our interest? Are we prepared to provide them with an alternative? So as, your question was, is it a shift in deterrence strategy? No. Does it have implications for deterrence strategy depending on how it plays out? Yeah, I think it does. And the underlying concern here, uh, not counting Yasik, but the other three members of this panel being American security analysts with Collectively, let's just round it off to 100 years of experience following international relations theory and uh, U.S. national security policy. And we're all kind of experiencing collective whiplash at some of the policy changes we're seeing. It's an exciting time.
Just want to give Amy a chance to expand a little more on her premise. Uh, Amy, your premise was that words matter. And certainly if Putin were to come out tomorrow and say, we'll never do a first strike, we wouldn't go about getting rid of our submarines and getting our stuff out of the silos and stuff. So it, you, you pointed out certain incoherences in the U.S. statements about how we might or might not use nuclear <laughs> weapons. Please expand a little more on why that matters. Um. Well, from the broader perspective of why it matters in general with the U.S.-Russian relationship, I think there's less there because we have 50, 60, 70 years of interaction with the Russians, with the Soviet Union, that even though things are uncertain and we could definitely benefit from strategic stability talks right now, and there are misunderstandings or disagreements about Russian nuclear doctrine right now, I think there's less of a concern about what we and the Russians say directly to each other. There's more of an understanding about the interaction and the deterrent effect of the forces we have, relatively speaking. I mean, there are problems in that relationship. But in addressing how we uh, approach deterrence to other countries or with other countries, I think the subject of this seminar, I mean, the whole idea that there are other regions and other threats and other countries where we are trying to impose a deterrence framework. If you only think of deterrence as your force posture, your training, your exercises, your cross-domain concerns, then you're missing the point of letting the other side know what it is you consider unacceptable and how you will respond if that happens. You're trusting them to look at what you're doing and what you have and draw their own conclusions. So to the extent that the whole conference here and the rest of the panels are about other parts of the world, you know, if the, the point is we want to bring deterrence to bear in our relationships with other nations and other regions, we can't just focus on what forces we're showing them and what practices we're showing them. We have to let them know when they will and won't, what they can and can't do before we react. So even though there are growing problems with Russia in Europe and in the Middle East, the point I'm trying to make is that if you're trying to bring this model to the rest of the world, which I think is why we're here, then you have to recognize that it requires some clear communication about what it is you're trying to deter and what you will do to deter it. Yeah, yeah, yeah if I may, I, I want to like go back to the question or comments about TPNW, so Treaty on the, the Prohibition of, of uh, yep. uh, Nuclear Weapons. Uh, so indeed, it's it's a challenge, and as Paul mentioned uh, in, in in his presentation, that uh, nuclear sharing, NATO nuclear sharing arrangements, in in particular, are the kind of a main target of uh, uh, TPNW uh, proponents. But also, I think what's even like uh, perhaps even more difficult for 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 the West is that the, the Western public is also let's say, the, the, uh, the audience of like movement behind the TPNW, like including ICANN, so, uh, ICAN. so you know, there's no ICANN in Russia, China, or in other countries, and uh, like public societies in, in, in the West, which to some degree, uh, or perhaps to large degree, are anti-nuclear, are, you know, the, the, the uh, all the 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 the, the, the um, like public rhetoric and and actions is is directed at them and I think it somehow pose kind of a um, challenge for like security communities uh, within NATO allied countries to like defend nuclear deterrence to somehow provide a good story why it is needed, why somehow we are better off with that than without it. And uh, like the, the, I think as, as our discussion to somehow reveal, revealed, like to what extent we, we are prepared for, for this, to what extent we, do we have a kind of a good story which we can 
somehow sell in uh, uh, very simple words to our public that they understand why nuclear deterrence in particular uh, provides them, them security. Can I touch the icon thing too? Um, I've sat through many, many meetings where we're always accused of ignoring the ban treaty within the nuclear weapons community in Washington, and we do. We ignore the ban treaty, most of us. I ignore it because Congress doesn't care about it, but uh, the sense within Washington, yes, there are a few people, and, and there are standard U.S. government statements that haven't changed very much from the Obama administration to the Trump administration about how not helpful the ban treaty is to the nonproliferation treaty process. But the debate, the people within Washington who find the ban treaty concerning versus the people who find it not concerning or less concerning is not a divide between people who think it will lead to the elimination of nuclear weapons versus people who don't think it will lead to the, nobody thinks it will lead to the elimination of nuclear weapons. The concern is based on whether or not it will have an influence on global public opinion or specifically allied public opinion. The ban treaty becomes a problem for the United States, not because, well, investments or things, not because it will affect U.S. nuclear policy in any way, but because there are a few of the allies in NATO who are either somewhat supportive of the goals or fear their publics may push them to become somewhat supportive of the goals, and therefore it will cause a problem within the alliance for public support of alliance doctrine. There is no debate in Washington about whether this treaty will affect nuclear policy or lead to nuclear disarmament or have any effect on the capabilities of the, or particularly with the P5, with the other countries. It's about the intervening approach to public opinion, particularly in a small number of the allies. And that's why it's left out of most conversations about U.S. nuclear policy, because most of them don't talk about the allies at all and specifically the public opinion. Do I add to that, Joe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, think, I think Amy's right. I, I would also cast it slightly, in slightly broader terms. The, the, the underlying issue here to me is, is, is what I call the so-called balanced approach. I mean, we've, we've tried to maintain a, a balanced approach to deterrence and disarmament or deterrence and nonproliferation over the years. Um, and this, I think, is a pretty sharp contrast between the, the 2010 NPR and the 2018 NPR. Uh, 20 NPR 2010 NPR, I think, you know, does, a, does a good job of trying to embody a balanced approach, which says, you know, we take deterrence seriously. We're going to adapt our forces and our capabilities to, to maintain effective deterrence, but we're also committed uh, to a balanced approach that emphasizes nonproliferation and, and reasonable advances toward, toward our Article VI obligations. Um, 20, I don't, I'm totally off the record here, right? Um, you know, if you talk to the, the drafters of the 2018 NPR, they'll tell you, oh, we, we take a balanced approach. Um, you know, we talk about arms control, but, but, but you know, I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's mostly lip service, quite honestly. Um, I don't think there's a true balanced approach there. Um, and I think that's part of the underlying problem uh, with things like, like, the, uh, like the ban treaty. Um, the United States, if, if the United States is not, uh, I think, acting and speaking in a way that shows seriousness toward, um, toward nonproliferation, toward threat reduction, uh, toward arms control, understanding all the constraints and making progress in those areas. But, but if we're not talking in a way that's perceived as sincere about these issues, um, things like the ban treaty are going to be the uh, are going to be the result. Uh, so I think I think I think the policymakers in Washington now need to need to take a hard look at at just how much they are in fact committed to a balanced approach. I think it all comes back to Schelling when he said that deterrence works if there's a the key ingredient for extended deterrence is the threat that leaves something to chance, right? So we don't need to provide a 100% guarantee we're going to respond in kind or respond to a particular event. We just need to raise the minds of the adversaries that if they start something, it'll lead to a process that we'll, we'll all lose control over. And I was struck by this when I was talking to some folks in the Baltics where they said that, the, that in, if the Russians were to do something and the local lieutenant from the Estonian or the Latvian armies can't call back home because there's cyber attacks and jamming. They have the authority to start shooting at Russians as soon as they walk across the border. And so my, my response to that is, do the Russians know this? 
because the placement of 4,000 Americans, Canadians, Germans, French, British, all the rest in the Baltics means that we already have the process, we already have the machine in place that if they do anything, the process will kick in regardless of what happens in Brussels, regardless of what happens in the White House. And so I guess the question for me is, does this mean that my ruthless pessimism about Donald Trump can, it doesn't come into play here because it's more or less out of his hands already? Can we, you know, in this one spot anyway, we've established a deterrence process that is already working in the mind of Putin, so we don't have to worry about what's in the mind of, of Donald Trump right now? Yeah, I, I, I think like, you know, um, like within NATO there is the sort of a discussion like what is necessary for deterrence, like do we have to like somehow be prepared to fight tonight or this sort of uncertainty about, you know, how we, how we gonna, how we gonna respond like is, is enough. So there are like divergent views on, on that, but like as you, as you said, the, the, the fact that there are troops from for many different nations uh, in the in the Baltic states and in Poland, like increase the chance that if something happens, you know, then the, the there would be an overwhelming response from 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 the whole alliance, and I think that's that's what matters.